it's possible to do both of those things. We have to. We have to. I mean, I'm not, as long as I hold public office, I'm going to continue to attempt to do both things. One more follow-up. Um, around this time last year when you were campaigning in Georgia, I think one of the things you told people was the power is literally in your hands. You know, if, if voters give Democrats the House and the Senate and, and the presidency, that all these big things can get accomplished. And, you know, we've seen stalemate. We've seen things being stymied. Um, why should folks believe you this time around? Can you think of any other president's done as much in one year? Name one for me. I'm asking you. <laughs> I'm serious. Hmm. You guys talk about how nothing's happened. I don't think there's been much on any incoming president's plate that's been a bigger menu than the plate I had given to me. I'm not complaining. Do that running in. And the fact of the matter is we got an awful lot done. An awful lot done. And there's more to get done. But look, let's, let me ask a rhetorical question. No, I won't. Anyway. Thank you. Yes. Be careful. Don't get hurt, man. No, no, I'm, I'm going to take care. Uh, Mr. President, thank you. Sebastian Smith from AFP. Another question on Ukraine. Uh, Ukraine borders four NATO member countries. How concerned are you, are you concerned, uh, that a real conflagration in Ukraine, if the Russians really go in there, that it could suck in NATO countries that are on the border and you end up with an actual NATO-Russia confrontation of some kind? And secondly, um, are you entertaining the thoughts of a summit with Vladimir Putin as a way to perhaps try and put this whole thing to bed, address their concerns, and negotiate a way out of this? The last part, the last question, yes, when we talked about whether or not we'd take the three meetings we talked about, and we talked about we would go from there, if there was reason to, to go to a summit. We talked about a summit as being before the Ukraine item came up in terms of strategic doctrine and what the strategic relationship would be. So I still think that is a possibility, number one. Number two, I am very concerned. I'm very concerned that this could end up being, look, the only war that's worse than one that's intended is one that's unintended. And what I'm concerned about is this could get out of hand, very easily get out of hand because of what you said, the borders of, the, of Ukraine and what Russia may or may not do. I am hoping that Vladimir Putin understands that he is short of a full-blown nuclear war. He's not in a very good position to dominate the world. And so I don't think he thinks that. But it is a concern. And that's why we have to be very careful about how we move forward and make it clear to him that there are, there are prices to pay that could, in fact, cost his country an awful lot. But I, of course you have to be concerned when you have, you know, uh, nuclear power invaded. This has, if he invades, it hasn't happened since World War II. This is the most consequential thing that's happened in the world in terms of war and peace since World War II. Yes. Uh, nearly two years have passed since the beginning of the global coronavirus outbreak, and you again today acknowledge that Americans are frustrated and they're tired. Based on your conversations with your health advisors, what type of restrictions do you imagine being on Americans this time next year, and what does the new normal look like for social gatherings and travel to you? Well, the answer is, I hope the new normal will be that we don't have, still have 30-some million people not vaccinated. I hope the new normal is people have seen what their own interest is and have taken advantage of, the, of what we have available to us. Number two, with the pill that is a problem, that appears to be as, as efficacious as it seems to be, that they're going to be able to deal with this virus in a way that after the fact you have an ability to make sure you don't get, self, you don't get very sick. Number three, um, I would hope that what happens is the rest of the world does what I'm doing and provides significant amounts of the vaccine to the rest of the world because it's not sufficient that we just have this country not have the virus or be able to control the virus, but that we can't build a wall high enough to keep a new variant out. So it requires one of the things that I want to do, and we're, we're contemplating figuring out how to do, not we are contemplating how to get done, and that is how do we move in a direction where the world itself is vaccinated? It's not enough just to vaccinate 340 million, fully vaccinate 340 million people in the United States. That's not enough. It's not enough to do it yet. We have to do it, and we have to do a lot more than we're doing now. And that's why we have continued to keep the commitment of providing vaccines and available uh, uh, um, cures for the rest of the world as well. And if I could, sir, and I should have said this before, Francesca Chambers McClatchy, how do you plan to win back moderates and independents who cast a ballot for you in 2020, but polls indicate aren't happy with the way you're doing your job now? I don't believe the polls. Well, why don't you just go down the road? Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, follow up on some of the questions about the vaccination program. You've given dozens of speeches this year urging Americans to get vaccinated. You've talked to reluctant Republicans. You've said it's people's patriotic duty. There have been very few mentions of the fact that young children under the age of five still in the third year of this pandemic in this country don't have access to the vaccine. Can you speak to frustrated parents a little bit about why that continues to be the case and when that might change? Because the science hasn't reached the point where they convinced that, in fact, it is safe. So that's what they're doing now. You could have asked me that. I got asked that question about uh, three months ago about people between the ages of you know, seven and 12. Well, and finally, they got to the point where they felt secure in the number of tests they had done and the tests they had run that it was safe. So it will come. It will come. But I can't, I'm not a scientist. I can't tell you when, but it is really very important that we get that, that, that next piece. 
One more follow-up on, on Build Back Better. When you said it's going to likely be uh, broken up into chunks, you, you mentioned that the climate pieces seem to have broad support. You mentioned Senator Manchin is a, is a supporter of uh, early child care. You left out the child tax credit, and I wonder if it's fair to read between the lines to, and assume that that is a piece, given Senator Manchin's opposition to it, uh, that the extension of that is likely one of those components that may have to wait uh, until There's sometime There's two long. really big components that I feel strongly about that I'm not sure I can get in the package. One is the child care tax credit, and the other is uh, help for cost of community colleges. They are massive things that I've run on, I care a great deal about, and I'm going to keep coming back at whatever four I get to be able to try to get chunks of all of that done. Yes, sir. Next man next to you. Left. Thank you, Mr. President. My name is Pedro Rojas. I'm with Univision National News. Ah, this is actually my first press conference here. It's good to meet you in person. We always have long press conferences. Awesome. <laughs> awesome. I got a couple of questions for you. Number one, uh, you said that you want to convey your message by getting out there in the country. I wonder if you're planning on traveling also to South America and other countries in the, in the Western Hemisphere. Uh, given the fact that China has, has gained a lot of influence in the region. And the second question is, what will be your message for residents in this country that are struggling every time they go to the gas station, every time they go to the grocery store and see the prices going high, and the pharmacy? I, I happen to come from South Texas where I saw a lot, of, a lot of people struggling financially in the last few months. And so I think you, I wonder what is the message you want to spread to them? Well, I try to express, I've asked, I try to answer that seven different ways today about how to deal with inflation. Um, but let me uh, answer the first question. I spend a lot of time in South America and in Latin America. When I was vice president, I spent the bulk of my eight years basically in Europe and or in, uh, in Latin America. I'm in contact with the leaders of the countries in South America. We're working closely with making sure that we do everything, for example, with the, uh, uh, to deal with um, helping uh, the countries in question, particularly those in Central America, to be able to help them with their ability to deal with the inter the People don't sit around in, in uh, Guatemala and say, I got a great idea. Let's sell everything we have, give the money to a, to a uh, coyote take us across a, a terribly dangerous trip up through Central America and up through Mexico and drop us, sneak us across the border, drop us in the desert. Won't that be fun? People leave because they have real problems. And one of the things I've done when I was a vice president, got support with, although I don't have much Republican support anymore, is provide billions of dollars to be able to say to those countries, why are people leaving and how are you going to reform your own system? And that's what we've worked on a long time. It still needs a lot more work. And we're focusing on that. I also believe I've spent a lot of time talking about and dealing with policy having to do with Maduro, who is a little more than a dictator right now. And the same thing in Chile and, Af and, uh, and not the same thing, but with Chile as well as Argentina. So, look, I, I made a speech a while ago when I was vice president saying that if we were smart, we have an opportunity to make the Western Hemisphere a united, not united, a democratic hemisphere. And we were moving in the right direction. Under, our, under the last administration, the Obama-Biden administration. But so much damage was done as a consequence of the foreign policy decisions the last president made in Latin America, Central America, and South America that we now have when I call for a summit of the democracies. I call that and a number of nations showed up for this summit of democracy. What is it that's going to allow us to generate? We've actually had a reduction in the number of democracies in the world. And it seems to me there's nothing more important. We used to talk about when I was a kid in college about America's backyard. It's not America's backyard. Everything south of the Mexican border is America's front yard, and we're equal people. We don't dictate what happens in any other part of, the, that, of this continent or the South American continent. We have to work very hard on it. But the trouble is we're having great difficulty making up for the mistakes that we've made the last four years, and it's going to take some time. Yes, down on the back. And then I'll go to this side, okay? Thank you, Mr. President. Alexander Nazarian, Yahoo News. Um, and thank you for holding this press conference. I hope there's more of them. Um, Anytime you, said, you have extra three hours, we can do it. We'll stay for a couple more. Um, you said you were surprised by Republican obstruction of your agenda, but didn't the GOP take exactly the same tactic when you were vice president to Barack Obama? So why did you think they would treat you any differently than they treated him? First of all, they weren't nearly as obstructionist as they are now, number one. They stated that, but you had a number of Republicans we worked with closely. From John McCain, I mean, a number of Republicans we worked closely with. Even back in those days, uh, Lindsey Graham. Um, and so the difference here is there seems to be a desire to work with. And I didn't say my agenda. I'm saying, what are they for? What, what is their agenda? They had an agenda back in the administration when the eight years we were president and vice president, but I don't know what their agenda is now. What is it? The American public is outraged about the tax structure we have in America. What are they proposing to do about it? Anything? Have you heard anything? I mean, anything. I haven't heard anything. The American public is outraged about the fact that we're the, uh, the, 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 the state of the environment, the vast majority of the public. What have they done? To do anything to ameliorate the climate change that's occurring other than to deny it exists. So what I'm saying is the difference between then and now is not only the announcement that was made, anything to stop Barack Obama, I get that part, but what eventually happened, we were able to get some things done. We were able to work through some things. On the stuff that was really consequential in terms of ideologically divisive, it was a real fight. But so, but I don't think there's a time when I, I mean, I wonder what would be the Republican platform right now? What do you think? What do you think the position on taxes are? 
What do you think their position on, on human rights? What do you think their position is on whether or not uh, uh, we should, uh, on the, what we should do about the cost of prescription drugs? What do you think? I mean, I, I just, I honestly, God, don't know what they're for. Yet I know a lot of these senators and congressmen, and I know they do have things they want to support, whether there's things I want or not. But you don't hear much about that. And every once in a while, when you hear something where there's a consensus, it's important but a small item, and it doesn't get much coverage at all where it occurs. I'm not being coverage. I mean, there's not much discussion about it. So I just think it's a different, and, and I, I don't know that um, no matter how strongly one supports the Republican and or supports the president, of, the former president of the United States, I don't know how we can't look at what happened on January 6th and think that's, that's a problem. That's a real problem. One, one more question, uh, Mr. President. Um, By the way, it's a quarter of guys now, so I'm going to do this. Just let's, If you answer me easy questions, I'll give you quick answers. Uh, there's an increasing concern, I think, among some Democrats that even if schools do continue to open, and I get that most of them are now open, Republicans will we weaponize this narrative of you, of, of you and other leading Democrats allowing them to stay closed in the midterms next year. Uh, and, you know, obviously that issue has a lot of traction with suburban parents, um, as I think what we saw. Mean, allowing, I'm confused by the question. I'm sorry. Well, that could school reopenings or closures become a potent midterm issue for Republicans to win back the suburbs? Oh, I think it could be, but I hope in God that they're, uh, that, look, maybe I'm kidding myself, but as time goes on, the voter who is just trying to figure out, as I said, how to take care of their family, put three squares on the table, stay safe, be able to pay their mortgage or their rent, et cetera, uh, has, is becoming much more informed on the, um, the motives of um, some of the political players and some of the uh, and the political parties. And I think that they are not going to be as susceptible to believing some of the outlandish things that have been said and continue to be said. You know, every, every president, not necessarily in the first 12 months, but every president in the first couple of years, most every president, excuse me, of the last presidents, at least four of them, have had polling numbers that are 44% favorable. So it's this idea that, but you all, not you all, but now it is, well, Biden's at one poll showed him at 33%. The average is 40, 44, 45%. One poll him at 49%. I mean, the idea that um, the American public are trying to sift their way through what's real and what's, and what's fake. And I don't think as, uh, I've never seen a time when the political coverage, the the choice of what political coverage the voter looks to has as much impact on as what they believe. They go to get reinforced in their views, whether it's uh, MSNBC or whether it's Fox or whatever. I mean, and one of the things I find fascinating that's happening, and you all are dealing with it every day, and it will impact on, on how things move, is that uh, a lot of the speculation in the polling data shows that the, um, that the uh, cables are heading south. They're losing viewership. Fox is okay for a while, but it's not baited. And a lot of the rest are predicted to be not very much in the, in the mix in the next four to five years. I don't know if that's true or not. But I do know that we have sort of uh, put everybody in, put themselves in certain alleys. And they decided that, you know, how many people who watch MSNBC also watch Fox other than their politician trying to find out what's going on in both places? How many people, again, I'm no expert in any of this, but the fact is, I think you have to acknowledge that what gets covered now is necessarily a little bit different than what gets covered in the past. I've had a couple, well, I shouldn't get into this. But the nature, not, the nature of the way things get covered has, in my observation over the years, I've been involved in public life, changed. And it's changed because of everything from a thing called the internet. It's changed because of the way in which uh, we have self-identified perspectives based on what channel you turn on, what 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 network you look at, not network, what, what, what cable you look at. And it's, um. It's never quite been like that. Anyway. On, on behalf of the Correspondent Association, thank you very much for, for, for standing for our questions. We hope the public has found it as enlightening as uh, those of us in the room have. I want to ask you, sir, about one of the overall... <laughs> I, mean, I can still stand. It's amazing. Right. We appreciate it. We, we very much do. So uh, the, the question I want to ask you gets to accountability, sir, uh, on one of the top public concerns, of course, which is the coronavirus and the, the government's response to it, whether it's confusion over what style of mask to wear, when to test, how to test, where to test, uh, you know, the, the public is confused, sir, and you see that in, in, in the drop-off in the polling on this question. Why did you tell Jeff that you were satisfied with your team? Why are you not willing to make or, or interested in making any changes, uh, either at the CDC or other agencies, given the fact that the messages have been so confusing? Well, first of all, the messages, to the extent they've been confusing, is because the scientists are learning more. They're learning more about what's needed and what's not needed. And so the fact is that the one piece that is uh, 
gotten a lot of attention is the the, uh, the communications capacity of the CDC. Well, she came along and said, "Look, I'm not. A, I mean, I'm a scientist, and I'm learning. I'm learning how to deal with stating what is the case that we've observed." Um, but look, I think that it's a little bit like saying when we went through the whole issue of how to deal with polio and the polio shots. What was said in the beginning was, oh, no, it's changed a little bit. We moved this way or that way. Or when we dealt with anything else. I mean, uh, it, as this was a brand new virus, a brand new phenomenon. Some of it was deadly. Other was more communicable. This is, this is an unfolding story. It's the nature of the way diseases spread. We're going to learn about it in a lot of other areas, just in, not just COVID-19. And so I think, you know, I look at it this way. Think about how astounding it was within the time frame that it took to be able to come up with a vaccine. You used to write about that. Pretty amazing how rapidly they came up with a vaccine that saved hundreds of thousands of lives. Did everything get right? No. And by the way, the idea whether we... Anyway, I'm talking to you. Thank you, Mr. Excuse President. Me. I have two really simple questions. I promise. <laughs> You campaigned on canceling $10,000 in student loans. Do you still plan to do so and when? And then my second question is, now that you've clarified the Bull Connor comments, do you plan to reach out to Republicans like Mitt Romney to talk about reforming the Electoral Count Act? Yes, I'm happy to speak out. I've, I've met with, I've talked to Mitt on other occasions. And by the way, I reached out to the, the, minority, the minority leader as well at the time this, that he they made a speech. And so um, I have no reluctance to reach out to any Republican and anyone who, and I've made it clear. Look, I've now had the opportunity to travel because of funerals and eulogies I've made and attended and congressmen and senators who come along with me. I don't, don't hold me to the number, but somewhere between 20 and 25 senators and congresspersons have traveled with me. And I find you should get the list of them and ask what, how we, I, you know, set for the two, three, four, five hours that we've flown together, sit back in, the, in that conference table and talk to them. Ask them questions. They ask me questions. I learn a heck of a lot. But as president, you don't quite have that ability to do that as often as I'd like to be able to do it. Um, and one of the things that I do think that has been made clear to me, speaking of polling, is the public doesn't want me to be the president's senator. They want me to be the president and let senators be senators. And so if I've made, I've made many mistakes, I'm sure. If I've made a mistake, I'm used to negotiating to get things done. And I've been, in the past, relatively successful at it in the United States Senate, even as vice president. But I think that role as president is, is a different role. Folks, it is now uh, almost six. With, with all due respect, I'm going to see you at next conference. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. President. Kristen, when you went by, I think she kicked me. I think that's what happened. No. But that's okay. <laughs> Thank you.